Hello and welcome to this episode of T-Tech. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the basics of operating systems. So, what I'm aiming for is to just show the big picture idea of what an operating system is. These concepts are going to apply to any computing system you can think of. All the way from a mobile phone, Apple or Android, through to your Wi-Fi router, to a server, to uh, an access point in a network, um, to your desktop machine. It doesn't matter. They all run an operating system, and that operating system is made up of code written in whatever programming language it may happen to be implemented in. So the big picture of what they do, regardless of the device it's running on and um, the programming language it's using, its job is to bridge the hardware and software together. And what the <clears throat> thing, the thing it's sharing these resources with, the hardware of the system, they're called processes. So the operating system is going to allocate and share resources with those processes. These are things like your web browser, um, your SSH client, and different kinds of programs that function on your system. There's also, with the hardware of the system, you have to have some way to interact with it, and we use drivers to do that in an operating system. So with the drivers and the processes, it can send data back and forth <coughs> excuse me, between the processes and the hardware. So it can also send packets back and forth. That's part of the operating system as well, and that's where things like routing come into play and different types of network devices. Um, and in addition, for long-term storage of things, we have things like hard drives and solid state drives and things like that. Well, operating systems using software, they use file systems that are implemented in a way to be able to read storage media and keep that organized in a way that your processes will be able to access. So the big picture is we have our hardware here at the bottom. And this is whatever it may happen to be. It doesn't matter, like I said uh, before. Then the kernel is the operating system that's running inside of the RAM after you boot up your machine. And all of the code inside of here is referred to as kernel space code. All right? That's kernel space code. And the kernel is the first thing that runs after you, after the machine posts, after you hit the power button, the bootloader loads first, and then it's going to find the kernel on whatever storage you're using, and then the kernel is going to start to boot up. After the kernel fully boots, processes are going to start to allow you to start to use the system. These are things like on Linux or on uh, the BSD operating systems, um, Getty, G-E-T-T-Y. Um, those will start. Or maybe your login manager on Linux Mint, or on Windows, your login screen. Those are all user land processes that start after the kernel initializes all of the hardware. And anything that is a process running on top of a kernel is called user land code. There's a big distinction. User land is going to request resources from the kernel using system calls, all right? But the kernel itself is has direct access to all of this and orchestrates those calls from the processes. I, this actually brings me back. When I was using uh, FreeBSD 6.1 on my first firewall that I dealt with, there was a time we used NAT-D to do network address translation on that box. And... Um, it was actually, there was more latency involved with it in the processes in user land. So I actually put the PF uh, firewall in place instead. Um, I don't mean PF sense, I mean packet filter, the PF code from OpenBSD. And um, that was in kernel space. And 
Kernel space has less latency than user land. That's what I want you to take away. Um, things in kernel space can run much faster because they don't have to be scheduled, and we'll get to that in one second. So the kernel. The kernel is actually made up of different groups of code. We have the scheduler, the network stack, drivers, and the file system. All of those sections I have laid out here are actually inside of the kernel as one big um, code base, essentially, that has things like if statements and while loops and different things implemented in the code like that. So the first thing I want to look at is the scheduler. The, all this does is says, okay, Firefox, for instance, you need to use the network. You might need to write to a file on the disk, maybe your history file or your bookmarks file. So all of those types of resources are going to be scheduled. So we have three different processes, and as you can see, the scheduler has scheduled them across the hardware resources, and um, across time, each of them gets a slice of the time to run on the CPU, and then the process has to release its time back, and the kernel can then pass those resources onto another process. So in this case, SSHD is running, listening for SSH connections from clients. And then LibreOffice is going to take a turn, and then Firefox is going to take a turn. They're all, those processes are all doing different things on the system, but they're being scheduled so they can share the resources. Now, this is also with CPUs and the cores, the amount of cores on them. You can have, you know, a single core system all the way up to 96 core systems plus nowadays. Um, but the more cores you have, the higher amounts of processes or threads per second the scheduler can can like orchestrate and make run on the system at one time so there's less latency and it can do more with the same amount of time so the network stack this is all about how we send data remotely to another system the interesting thing about network stacks is they can be one uh, kernel and then a single network stack or on like Cisco iOS routers you can have VRFs which can be their own uh, network stacks in themselves or you can have virtual machines or Docker or FreeBSD jails. All of those could be different network stacks running on the same system. But in general, they always use packets to send data over a computer network at the end of the day. The term that's used is sockets, and the socket interface is what the processes are using to send data. There is something called socket calls, and there's multiple of them, in every operating system out there, and the processes use them to send data. So the design of the network stack in it's a standardized des standardized design. It's based off the OSI and TCP IP models, all right? So because of those models, the network stack can manage lots of different network protocols, and they can all run concurrently. Like, for instance, we can have IPv4 and IPv6 running together in a dual stack. Or you could run Ethernet while you're also running um, 802.11 for Wi-Fi on the same system. But you can also, in a network stack, manage aspects of packets. And this is where firewall code in a network stack can do things like network address translation or do stateful packet inspection. So when I'm doing things like building a firewall with OpenBSD, for instance, or Linux, um, as an example, a lot of what I'm doing in those videos is I'm changing aspects of how the network stack is working in those respective operating systems. So a router is really, its network stack is going to work differently than your mobile phone's network stack because they need to do different jobs with that hardware. So all of these functions you can load into the kernel as modules or 
if you build your Linux or FreeBSD kernel, for instance, you can integrate them in. And um, <clears throat> speaking of drivers, drivers are a big part of the network stack for the network interface cards in your system to receive packets. So the interfaces that get you out to the internet. They use drivers to receive packets and to send them. So the drivers interact with all of this hardware. It can be a hard drive, it can be a USB device, it could be a webcam, a Wi-Fi card, it doesn't matter, but drivers interact with the interface of the device. So there's firmware in every device in your computer, and that firmware speaks a certain language, okay? So the driver has to be able to translate on one side of that equation with the firmware's language, but on the other side, it has to be able to speak to the, to the operating system. And then the operating system can then pass the data to the process that was requesting. So like LibreOffice, it wants to use a system call to write data to the disk. Well, the driver gets that request and then um, sends that request to the disk. Then on the other end of that, if it's a mechanical disk that uses magnetic um, fields to represent ones and zeros, the other the controller takes care of that. The driver, the operating system doesn't need to care about the rest of that procedure, nor does the process, because the process is up in user land. This takes place in the kernel space and the hardware. So that's how <clears throat> the drivers are helping us to do these kinds of things. It doesn't have to be a hard drive, it can be lots of things. Same thing though, it can be module, modularized in the kernel, or you can integrate it. But all of drivers, whether they're network card drivers, whether they're hardware, um, hard disk drivers, they send and receive data when interrupts come in, either uh, from the device or a certain timeout has elapsed for that operation. So if it hears that interrupt, it's going to query that driver and send it up to the kernel. And then if it was something a certain process was waiting on, it will send it to user space. If it was something the kernel was doing, like filtering a packet or changing a source IP address in the PF firewall, it will use the kernel in that case and not go up to user land. But you can use hardware devices in many different ways in operating systems. But drivers get data from that device to the process. So file systems, they, if you have a hard drive and storage, they're going to make that be one single pool. And it has to be a certain file system format. Like for Windows, it can be NTFS. Or for like OpenBSD, it can be FFS. Um, FreeBSD can be UFS. Linux is extension. All you're doing is representing all that data, all the physical uh, disks, as one single pool of resources. So that's what you're doing with file systems. And again, you can put the code in as a module or integrate it. You can have access control lists inside of file systems. They manage permissions. So things like change routes <clears throat> in file system areas like SSHD, can, you can operate that in a part of the file system that's change rooted off from the rest of the system. So you can run a process as a certain user that only has access to certain parts of the file system. That's a good way that servers secure themselves against if someone attacks the server and gets into the system. There's also metadata with file systems. Like this is an interesting area. It can be used in forensics, it can be used in lots of different stuff but it keeps track of files and folders and their access time, size, the location on the disk, so what folders they're in, what inode group it's in, what part of the physical hard drive it's stored on. Um, also things as simple as used in free space get tracked by the file systems. But <clears throat> overall though, that's what a file system does. It just manages files long term on a storage medium. It doesn't matter if you have one hard drive or you know, 20 hard drives, or how much storage those may be. It's going to just make it all a single pool. So with that, though, that's a broad overview of what operating systems are 
and how they operate on computer systems. And again, this applies to anything you can think of, from your mobile phone to your desktop to your Wi-Fi router. They all run operating systems that are doing this. All these systems like Linux and OpenBSD and FreeBSD and Windows and Mac OS, they all run like this. So I hope that was informative for you, and I hope it made sense. But as always, it's been Tyler with T-Tech, and I would like to thank you for viewing this video, and have a very nice day.